But I have discovered that there is a top and a bottom path in attitude. And the reason I've found them is I've walked both of them. I've been there. And without boasting, what you see today in me hasn't always been there. What I am today, or let me put it this way, I am not what I was. And if I was to boast, it would be that God changed me. And that one there would be the first to to acknowledge it. (laughs) First of all, we can have this top road, which is the attitude that we want to magnify, magnify our importance. We feel that we're indispensable, that we deserve special treatment. We want privilege, we want consideration, and we want recognition. And by the way, my opinion matters most. But you know, if we don't wake up to this attitude, God will sometimes let us learn just how small we are and just how capable God is because he just carries on the work without us. And over the years I've seen prominent people in various churches who thought it would all collapse if they left. And I was one of them at one time. But you know, when I left it didn't. If God is in it, he will raise up another and then another and the work will go on. When God decides to build a church, even the gates of hell can't prevail. The problem of magnifying our own importance can happen to anyone. But it usually develops in the heart of a leader. Pride has taken down many leaders. Sometimes we try to be something that God never intended for us. You know, for years I tried to be something. Nobody knows how much I tried to persuade God to use me in another area of ministry. But God wasn't one for changing his mind. And then I accepted that my gift was teaching, and now we're moving. Amen? Another person wants to sing solo. Even if God hasn't gifted them in in that way. Listen, I've learnt this. There are crows and there are blackbirds. (laughs) And how do you know if you've got a gift? Simply, other people will have time to listen to the gift. But on the other hand, we've got the lower path, those who refuse to recognize their worth. It's an attitude which says, it doesn't matter whether I'm here or not. It doesn't matter if I miss church, whether I miss prayer meeting, it doesn't matter if I tithe, or it doesn't matter if I go to the Bible study. Church, please, don't minimize your importance to the body of Christ. There is something for all of us to do. And you know, your little is much when God is in it. Just be faithful. There was an elderly preacher who was rebuked by one of his deacons one Sunday morning, just before the service started. Pastor said to the man, Something must be wrong with your preaching and your work. There's been only one person added to the church in a whole year, and he's just a boy. And the man, minister listened, and his eyes moistened, and his thin hands trembled. I feel it all, he replied. But God knows I've tried to do my duty. And that day the minister's heart was heavy as he stood before the congregation. As he finished the message, he had a strong inclination to resign. After everyone else had left, that one new boy came to him and asked, 
do you think if I worked hard for an education, I would become a preacher, perhaps a missionary? And again, the tears welled up in the minister's eyes. Ah, this heals the ache I feel, he said. Robert, I see the divine hand now. May God bless you, my boy. Yes, I think you will become a preacher. Many years later, an aged missionary returned to London from Africa. His name was spoken with reverence. Nobility invited him into their homes. He had added many souls to the Church of Jesus Christ, reaching even some of Africa's most savage chiefs. His name was Robert Moffat. The same Robert who years before had spoken to the pastor that Sunday morning, that old Scottish Kirk. My prayer is, Lord, help us to be faithful. Then give us the grace to leave the results to you. However, at the centre of attitude is another path. With a sign which says, why are we doing it? Most of us at some time consider why, why we're doing something. I remember, it's about 60 years ago now, I was sitting in the laboratory in a factory where I worked, and that day I asked myself, why am I doing this? It changed my life. I became a fireman. Why do we come to church? There was a time I went to church and I make no bones about it because the girls were there. <laughs> On another occasion I went to church because I enjoyed doing youth work. Why Trinity? Now that's a good question to ask me because in the beginning I didn't want to come here. <laughs> it was God who changed my mind. Let me tell you another story. Clarence Jordan was a man of unusual abilities and commitment. He had two PhDs, one in agriculture, one in Greek, and another in Hebrew. So gifted was he, he could have chosen to do anything he wanted. He chose to serve the poor. In, 1940, in the 1940s, he founded a farm in Georgia, America, and he called it Kionia Farm. It was a community for poor whites and poor blacks. And as you might guess, such an idea didn't go well down in the deep south in the 1940s. Ironically, most of the resistance came from the good church people who followed the laws of segregation as much as the town people. The town people tried everything to stop Clarence. They tried boycotting him, slashing the workers' tires when they came to town. Over and over for 14 years they tried to stop him. Finally, in 1954, the Ku Klux Klan had had enough of Clarence Jordan, so they decided to get rid of him once and for all. They came one night with guns and torches, and they set fire to every building on Kynonia Farm, except Clarence's house, which they riddled with bullets. And as they chased off, all the families, except one black family, who refused to leave. Clarence recognised the voices of many of them. And as you might guess, some of them were church people. Another one he recognised was the local newspaper reporter. And the next day, that reporter came out to see what remained of the farm. The rubble still smouldered and the land was scorched, but he found Clarence in the field, hoeing and planting. I hear the awful news he called to Clarence, and I came out to do a story on the tragedy of your farm closing. Clarence just kept hoeing and planting. The reporter kept prodding, kept poking, trying to get a rise from this quietly determined man, 
who seemed to be planting ahead of his packing bags. So finally the reporter said in a haughty voice, well, Dr. Jordan, you've got two of them PhDs and you've put 14 years into this farm and there's nothing left of it all. Just how successful do you think you've been? And Clarence stopped, turned towards the reporter with his penetrating blue eyes and said quietly but firmly, about as successful as the cross. Sir, so I don't think you understand us. What we're about is not success, but faithfulness. We're staying. Good day. Beginning that day, Clarence and his companions rebuilt Kynonia, and the farm is still going strong today. Whatever we're doing, you and I have got to be doing it for the right reason. I thank God for those who have allowed God to mould their attitude and who he's using now to build this church. However, it was not just attitude that got the church birthed. The disciples had the right attitude and purpose. And some might say it was that which directed them to do the right thing. They were all together and they were all praying. One day, while on a vacation, D.L. Moody, have you heard of him? He visited a large but dead church in London. And the pastor prevailed upon him to preach there in all the services. He didn't want to, but he agreed. He preached and later said that they were so unresponsive, it was all he could do to get through the morning message. Then it occurred to him that he might have to endure the same thing that night when he was supposed to be on holiday. He dreaded it all afternoon. But you know, behind the scenes there was something going on. An elderly woman that morning went home to her invalid sister and told her about Moody being there. And the invalid sister, her eyes lit up for she had been praying that God would send Moody to England. Put the lunch away, she said. We'll spend the rest of the afternoon in prayer and fasting. And they did. Moody said, he stood up that night before the people and he could tell something was different. It was alive with electricity of the power of God. You could feel it in the air. He preached with an unexplained freedom. And he gave the invitation to, to those, if they wanted to be saved, to stand. 500 stood on their feet. And shocked, he thought, they'd misunderstood what I said. So he said, be seated. Then he said, now look, I am saying... Stand up if you want to give your life to Jesus. The 500 stood up again. And it was the beginning of what became one of the greatest revivals in England. Why? Because two old ladies, one of them bedridden, said, we don't need more organization, we don't need more activities, we need the power of God on this place. And they paid the price in prayer. Prayer, I keep on about it tonight. Prayer changes everything. Prayer, the wonder-working power of prayer. Friends, prayer brings the presence of God. You only got to walk in here on a Tuesday morning to feel the presence of God. We're not doing anything except praying. But the power and the presence of God is here. Matthew 18, where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Church, we need the presence of God. I don't want to be rude. I have been in so many churches where the presence of God is missing. You can tell it the moment you walk into the church. 
You might have heard of this man, Charles Finney. He said, when the presence of God is in the church, the church will draw the world in. If the presence of God is not in the church, the world will draw the church out. And that's ever so true. Believers who have the presence of God in their lives will be drawn to God. And they will also draw others to God. And those who have the presence of the world will be drawn to the world and they'll end up leading others into the world. The presence of God is brought to us by the Holy Spirit through Jesus. One only has to look at the believer to see if the Holy Spirit is being allowed to rule. I can tell that. Whenever I walk up to a believer, I can tell instantly whether the Holy Spirit is being allowed to rule or not. Let me give a couple of illustrations by Melvin Newland. The one I like is the story about three prospectors who found a rich vein of gold in California during the gold rush days. They realized what a great discovery they had. And they decided, we have a really good thing going here, as long as no one else finds out about it. So they each took a vow to keep it secret. So they headed for town to file their claim and get the equipment necessary to mine the gold. And true to their vows, they didn't say a word to anyone. They filed their claim, their claim, got their equipment, and headed back to the mine. But when they did, a crowd of people followed them. And the reason was because of the expression on their faces. It had given them away. Their faces were aglow in anticipation of the wealth that would soon be theirs. People knew that they must have found something very special. So a crowd followed them. It's true, isn't it? You can't hide it. If you've got something inside you, it's going to show. There was also a, a famous motivational speaker. And he was once asked, what was the most difficult speech you had to give? And he thought and he answered, well, it was when I was asked to speak at a national convention of undertakers. My topic was to explain to them how to look sad during a $20,000 funeral. You didn't get that, did you? <laughs> An undertaker conducting a $20,000 funeral, how are they going to remain looking sad when they're thinking of all the money that's going to be coming in? You see, when there's joy inside, it's very hard to stop it showing. Friends, if the Holy Spirit is truly within us, if we've had our own Pentecost, then we're going to be able, well, we're not going to be able to hide his character. It's going to shine forth. Do you mind if I go a little bit deeper on that text? When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Friends, there's unity of the Spirit and there's unity of convenience. How often do we get together just to get a job done? And we can even do that in church. We hide our differences in the common cause of reaching the lost. It's admirable and it's necessary. But listen, when we get rid of the undercurrents that divide and we are the same mind to each other and we don't speak of any other thing, we become perfectly joined. Or are we going to ignore the subtle difference and hide behind the work of the Lord? How long are we going to listen to perversions that tell us that 
this kind of unity is not possible or expected of us. A man was in a ministry and he spoke to me and he said, I plan to make use of such and such a person for such and such a job. And you know, the spirit flashed to me and said, the devil makes use of people and then discards them. Church, let's be careful of what we do with the sons and daughters of God. Don't treat them as rags to be used and thrown aside. Everyone is precious. I remember the words of our Master Jesus, who looked at his disciples and said, From now on, I call you my friends. For all things that the Father has showed me, I have told you. Unity of convenience is only to get a job done. It's just a partnership. It's a putting up with, and at his very best, a tolerance of love for someone else. That kind of unity never knows the grand will of God, but is always learning and never able to manifest the truth. In that kind of unity, true love, unfeigned love, fervent love, and love without dissimulation amongst the brethren, it will never manifest. You'll never see it. Much less laying down our lives for one another. Unity of the Spirit is a restful, harmonious working together. It's like bone upon bone, sinew upon sinew. It's a manifesting of the mind of Christ in a holy congregation. It's the glorious love of God flowing like a river. And the only way to be filled with all the fullness of God is to know the love of God. But when love is quenched, God is quenched. For God is love. I hear a man say, we can have friendship with some, but not fellowship. But what does the precious word of God say to us? Let me read it to you, 1 John 1. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. From time to time, we have had definitions of unity through the eyes of human experience and understanding. And because of cultural differences, and for dozen dozens of other reasons, we have been consistently told that there cannot be perfect unity this side of heaven. That we're able to rejoice and marvel in unity and diversity. Well, God leaves no room for misunderstanding about the kind of unity that he wants. It's expressed in the heart hunger and the cry of our dear Lord Jesus, who prayed in John 17, Father, let them be one, even as we are one. Do you for a moment think that this prayer of Jesus, when he was here on earth, is not going to be answered? Those who were born of the Spirit will not talk of culture from the East or from the West of, or a culture from the North Pole. They talk of a divine culture, a Christian culture, a holy culture, a culture from above, for they're not of this world, even as he was not of this world. They are one peculiar and holy nation under God. That's you and I that he's talking about there. We are peculiar to him. And we are holy because of Jesus. What a love that is. What a unity. One with each other and one with the Lord. Is it any wonder that every Tuesday 
I deliberately take time to offer that prayer. And we're seeing it. We're seeing this church coming together. People come to me and they said, I can't get over Trinity. There's something there. They haven't just they haven't put their finger on it, but you and I know what it is. It's called love. And it's called unity. It's oneness. Jesus said, staying in 1 John 17, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. And that's what he's looking for. Forget the differences. Hallelujah. There's only one Keith Jarvis. You can dance now, okay? <laughs> Somebody will say hallelujah to that. There's only one of them. And praise God, there's only one of you. But seriously, we're all different. We're not talking about changing differences. We're talking about love, allowing you and I to work together, despite our differences. Don't let them get in the way. Love overcomes. Love will rule. I tell you, people of God, unless we know and we walk in this kind of love, we're never, ever, ever going to be filled with the absolute fullness of God. Amen.